Jesus, bless this this collection of verses, Lord, and the concepts that go with them. We ask, Lord, your blessing upon this truth, these truths. Touch our bodies, Lord, that we might be well while we're listening and be recovered from all sicknesses that are assaulting us. And help our minds, Lord, to hear it, but help our hearts to comprehend it. Amen. This is a chat, as it were, an exhortation, a motivational set of verses, which I just simply have entitled, Scripture Bites. Scripture Bites. So pulling out of my little box of bites, here are some scriptures and some commentary behind it. Trusting that the Lord will anoint the commentary, since obviously the scriptures already are. <laughs> the first one I'd like to read is Romans 14.23. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's the only part of the verse I'm looking at right now. It's hard sometimes to acknowledge that a lack of faith is not merely a subtracting of a positive that, as it were, brings us back to natural zero. But rather, instead, it takes us across the zero line into the negative value. Sin. Sin. It is a mistake. It is wrong. It is not a good practice. Faith is something which we have to reach for. If we stop reaching for it, we are already in sin. It's just like saying the first commandment is to love God. Well, I love God. Really? Yeah, I love God. Sure, of course I do. We all do, right? But God looks at it and says, here, I'll test to see whether or not you love me. Let's see how much you love me. <laughs> not a test in the in the uh, I don't know because I'm not God sense where I don't have knowledge, but in the sense of the devil going, I don't think they love you, not really. God goes, all right, I'll allow you to test their love, but you'll find out you're wrong. They love me. Faith, of course, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things are not seen. Faith, of course, is a persuasion. But so much of the time we treat the absence of faith as though, oh well, you know, so I didn't believe, so what? Now, if I smoke, or I chew, or I do, or I don't do, now that's a sin. You know, but if I have trouble with my belief and I'm struggling with my faith, um, that's just the human condition, right? That's just normal. We all struggle with our faith. So surely God understands that we're just struggling with our faith. Surely he understands that the reason we don't have gifts in the church is because we all struggle with our faith. I'm sure he understands even our disobediences because we just struggle with our faith. That's what we're here for, is to grow, to change in faith. Consider a different side to this. Forgive me, but my sinuses are in the way. Consider the other side to this. If it is sin, truly sin, that it needs to be repented of. 
And the question is, have you repented of your lack of faith? Have you stepped up to the plate in admission? Or are you still hiding behind the bush, hearing God saying, Adam, Adam, where art thou? In fear, and not so certain you want to come out and say, yeah, well, uh, you see, uh, but Dad, I, uh, well, you see, uh, why are we so slow to repent about our unbelief? And I'm not pointing to anybody, you know, that I don't have one going this way and four going this way, fingers-wise. But we deal with faith so glibly. And part of it is the world. The world has trained us to be that way. The world has said, you know, yeah, these faith people, these faith preachers, you know, they... Can you imagine that they actually said that it was because of lack of faith that so-and-so was sick, or lack of faith that so-and-so... See, that this, this is wrong. It should have been compassion we showed. Not tell them they lacked faith. Faith is just, you know, is, is the thing that you, you uh, mysteriously believe, you know. You can't do anything about your faith. Some people go so far as to say, you know, God's given us the measure of faith. So if this is my measure of faith, this is all I've got. It's not my fault. It's just, you know, God gave me a measure of faith. I believe for the following five items, and I just have no belief for any of the other items. You know? So I'm glad that you believe, brother, sister. I'm glad that you have faith in those areas. The body of Christ certainly needs faith in those areas. But I, you know, I have my measure of faith. How many ways can we, either theologically or philosophically or sociologically or psychologically, justify our sin? Meanwhile, do you know what so-and-so did? Do you know what so-and-so <coughs> did? You know? Which sin is greater, might I ask? Which sin is greater? The deeds of the flesh or the deeds of the mind? The deeds of our inner thoughts that guide the ship and the outer expression which guides the tongue or the deeds of the flesh that we all love dramatizing on national television. You know, to, I think we should start a new Christian series called To Catch the Flesh, a reality show where we investigate every single member of the church and see can we find, is there anything that they've been hiding because Christians claim to be perfect and they're not. <laughs> we'll catch them at their sins. <laughs> Meanwhile, today in the news, God is dead. Evolution is true. And you're an ape, <laughs> as we read this morning. Our faith, our belief in God, our mechanism by which it is all accomplished. I was reminded this week by God, by the Spirit, by my own self even, of the vision that I had many years ago where God puts me in this vision and shows me a pair of wings on my back. And I was, wow, those are big wings. What are those? <laughs> That's your faith. Whoa, they're big. So how do you use them? <laughs> that was my next question. How do I use them? And I realized I have to activate my will. Oh, no, I didn't ask for that. And what are they for? What are those wings for? Well, they're for getting you into the spirit. Oh, I was a rookie. I was a young Christian. I didn't know two quarters of nothing about nothing. I'm like, you know, maybe two years in, three years in at the most, still learning and growing in intercessory prayer and all that. So, oh, so I have to activate my will. How do I activate my will? Uh, right here. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the will activator. It is the catalyst. You know how chemistry has the one substance and the other substance? And the one substance does nothing until the other substance is introduced? Mm -hmm. When you start standing on scriptures, you've introduced the activator that goes with your faith. And the next thing you know, in my particular visionary analogy, the wings open up. Ooh. And the more you do that, the stronger they get, the stronger they get. What happens? You generate your own current, 
And away you go. You want to get in the spirit? Quit expecting it to fall out of the sky and land on you like a brick. Yeah, God knows my number. Hey, he knows where I'm at. Unbelief. Sin. 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 Come to me, my son and daughter. Come to me, my God. Come to me, my son and daughter. Come to me, my God. But you're God. Why don't you just come out under here and change everything? Mm -hmm. We're your Elohim. Why don't you make a decision and change everything? <laughs> Sin in our midst is leaven in our bread, and we are getting fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter without really becoming healthier. Sin must be purged. That's right, I've got to beat on my flesh some more. No, you need to introduce something that's going to kill all that other stuff. I love what my wife is teaching me about antibiotic and probiotic. <laughs> I'm starting to learn a lesson, at least spiritually, on this matter. It's not enough to try to shove things against my disease and pick a bigger, meaner dog to attack this ugly, fleshly dog. Pound on it. I need to introduce the other stuff that reinforces my happy immune system and says, be strong, be happy. I have to become a believer. Believers shall lay hands on the sick. It does not say the spiritually perfect shall lay hands on the sick. It does not say them who have purged themselves of all flesh as the Gnostics did in the days of old, standing in cold showers, wearing white robes, and worshipping for days on end so they could get one drop of heaven to come out. <laughs> this is why Jesus chose a fisherman and a tax collector mm -hmm. and a dude hanging in a tree and visited Zacchaeus and... <laughs> This is why he picked the motley crew he picked, to take the foolish things of this world, to confound <coughs> all the smart people out there whose smarts is based on unbelief. Yeah. Now, if we increase our faith, perhaps we won't have to repent so much. Okay? But increasing your faith doesn't mean you just became sinless. Because there's so many areas to believe God for. There are so many places that we should be believing Him for. That all we're going to do is grow from faith to faith. So, I would encourage you, not with a whip on your back and a brick on your shoulder to carry the heavy load of repentance, but merely to say, Sorry, boss. You know, kind of the get smart style apology. Oops, sorry boss. And move on. But move on. Find the verses you're supposed to be standing on. Remember the visions and dreams he's given you. Remember the sermons that have been preached at you for years. As the, as the fingers of the preachers have ended up losing their fingerprints from typing so much. I'm kidding. <laughs> feel, feel bad for preachers now? <laughs> if you consider how many meals preachers have cooked that nobody's eaten never became substance because it sat at the table we nibbled a little bit oh that was a good sermon wasn't that a good sermon oh yes why it had a hint of spice in it it did yes as a matter of fact I think I recognize that spice we had it about three weeks ago yes and that was a fine cookie we had afterwards was it not great sense of humor and another one bites the dust, and another one bites the dust. <laughs> and they drop like flies all around us. While we had a great time in our banqueting table of unbelief. So, I would encourage us, that was your little bite, your first scripture bite. Oh, it is spelled B-I-T-E. Did I say that? <laughs> I'm kidding. Our second bite. Here's a little morsel for you to think about with me. Seek ye first the kingdom of him. Luke 12.31. Luke 12.31. Let's read it in the official text instead of the Anthony paraphrase text. Luke 
1231. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Verse just before it says, Your father knows what you need. <laughs> he knows what you need. Why, he's got it on a long laundry list that you supplied a long... <laughs> Actually, you're not much different than the rest of humanity. Your laundry list is no different than anybody else's. 6,000 years God's been listening to. But you didn't bring us out here to die, did you? <laughs> 6,000 years he's been listening to. Well, if God would just... Neat, 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 dot, dot, dot. 6,000 years we have stated our needs. Right? 6,000 years. And you know, I know what you need. I'm a not deaf. I'm a not stupid. I got eyes, you know. I can hear you. Now, the question is, can you hear me? Seek ye first the kingdom's Seek ye. I just need that name word first there. Just, but rather seek ye. The other verse says seek ye first. So this one just says seek ye the kingdom of God. Oh, oh I am seeking the kingdom of God. I'm, I'm looking to get to heaven. I gave my heart to the Lord so I could have heaven. I, I'm seeking after getting to heaven. I'm seeking after leaving this dumb, stupid planet and moving on to the next better place. Thank you very much. I'm seeking. See, I'm seeking. And we have sermons to tell us all about that wonderful place out there, somewhere, someday, somehow. No wonder the world says we teach a pie-in-the-sky idea. How about feeding the pie down here? How about the kingdom coming this way for a change? Jesus says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of heaven's come near to you. Jesus says the kingdom's in your midst. Jesus says, hey, hello, kingdom here. And we go, kingdom? Kingdom? Oh, you mean religion. You mean, you mean program. You mean order. You mean decently in an order. You mean none of that fuzzy stuff in church, right? That's what you mean, right? Seek the kingdom. Perfection. People who are fleshless. That's what we mean by the kingdom, right? People who are absolutely perfect. Because the kingdom of God is full of nothing but perfect people. Right. The kingdom, you know, that great place, that church I've been looking for, but it wasn't there, so I went to another one. That church I was looking at, that wasn't okay, but I went to another one. That man of God that I followed, it was great, but he wasn't good enough. You know, I was looking for the kingdom. I was seeking it, and I didn't find it here. Didn't find it there. Didn't find it over there either. Look it over here. It's not over there. I keep looking for God, but I can't find him anywhere, one man one time said. I've been all over the United States. I haven't found God anywhere. Well, that's a sad statement. How about doing it the other way around? How about, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is God's will not being done down here? All these promises of the book, are they for down here or up there? I don't need them up there. They'll be all fulfilled up there. I'm having trouble with them down here. But what kinds of things in the kingdom, then, should we be asking for? Well, first of all, the will of God to be operative. Obviously. You can't have a king dumb without a king. Duh. So the king's got to show up. If the king shows up, then his court shows up. If the court shows up, then a lot of other things show up. Ever watch any of the old movies when the kings come to town? Everything changes when the king comes to town. I'll be coming across the barge to see you in about two days, John. And everything goes into motion. Do you think maybe the church universe would change if Jesus Christ announced tomorrow to all the preachers and prophets, by the way, I'll be showing up uh, tomorrow at two? I wonder how much house cleaning would take place that has been forgotten. I wonder how many coins we'll discover as we clean it, so to speak. I wonder how many ways will come popping up dressed nicely and cleanly and our spiritual robes on and, and you know, the cigarette butts out the back door and the ickler over there and the other ickler over there and the... That's a 
mess up for the word liquor. You know, we don't have liquor in the house. We have Ickler. <laughs> you know, we don't have idols. We have American idols. Anyway, I'm kidding. The things that we would quickly uh, tuck, toss and, you know, if we honestly got an announcement that Jesus was showing up in two hours, what would we do? You come to church on a Sunday morning. Oh, good. Yeah, okay, I'm here. All right, I'm a preacher. Feed me. Uh, by the way, guys, Jesus will be here in 15 minutes. I summoned him yesterday. <laughs> oh, that just changes everything. The perspective just goes out the window. I haven't asked for a lot of things I could ask for as a pastor, I realized. That's not good. <laughs> You haven't asked for a lot of things that you could ask for regarding me. Oh, boy. <laughs> if we really believed that we could bring the kingdom of heaven on earth and that what we bind on earth would be bound in heaven and what we loose on earth would be loosed in heaven, we actually believe that if our tongue goes plop, 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 something happens. If our heart goes pum, 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 pum. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? If we actually believed that when we activated our will, these wings would start working and the waves of air would start coming underneath and maybe we'd get some lift off the ground around here. If we really believed that we could say, Lord, uh, we need you to send a spirit of wisdom there. We need you to send a, a deal with the false prophets there. We need you to get my picture. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Sounds so King James. <coughs> it's a figure of speech, right? It doesn't really mean anything other than chase after God. I'm chasing after God. I'm not a heathen. <laughs> but if we really took it for what it said as all the resources of heaven are available to you, go seek it. Go get it. Go knock on the door. Open it up. Lord! Lord! We need some bread down here in sector 5. Lord! Lord! We need some... Now that's a different kind of way of looking at things. All the great men and women of God that we can think of, what did they really do? Except finally get their finger dipped in the well of up there somewhere. And bring a little water back to a bunch of really parched folks. And took a little bread, you know. I was telling, telling my neighbor this week, I said, it's a remarkable thing. You, you have trouble believing that God created the universes in six days. Do you believe that Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes? It's the model. Here. Break. Bam. Two fish. Break. Bam. Four fish. Break. Bam. Ten fish. Why is this so hard to believe that he put a fish in the water and by the end of the day the oceans were teeming? Jesus himself stood right there in front of human beings and did it under the power of God. Bam. 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 And you have trouble with the idea of Animals, bam. Humans, bam. Anything, bam. It, you know, I always joke with him because I go, and he goes, oh, don't do that. That's so bewitched or, or I dream a genie or whatever. <laughs> I, and that just seems so phony. But think about it. That's what you call a miracle. <laughs> I don't call that a miracle. I call that bad finger snapping. We see if somebody tried to snap their fingers at camp. They haven't quite mastered that yet. It kind of goes, <laughs> you know, they're not quite at the. And then there's that fellow that we watched on one of those shows. Of, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's like, man, his hands must hurt afterwards. But you get my point. This is God. You know, some of us can kind of click out a, I got it. See, some of us can do the other fingers on the sides. A few can do the pinkies. I can't do the pinkies. And this guy's doing all four. <laughs> well, now think of God, okay? Our God can do all ten million of them at once. Our God can do anything you want him to do. Our God has an entire kingdom of resources. Perhaps we are struggling too hard with our idea. You know what I mean? Our idea of miracles. Well, as soon as I get my whatever to my wherever, then my however, then he ever can, you know. 
It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom, it says in verse 32. It's his good pleasure. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you, give you, give you the kingdom. Yeah, it's his good pleasure to give me heaven when I get there. Yes, it is true. We are headed for heaven. Yippee. But yeah. as Christians are beginning to learn, they made a big mistake in the early 1900s in abdicating their responsibility on earth. So now we run around and do a lot of our responsibility on earth, our political responsibility, our social responsibility, our, okay, let's, let's gear it up, boys. It's now time to do the other responsibilities. We're still not there. We're still, we're still carrying out the gospel with our natural minds. And we need to carry it out with our spiritual minds. I'm not saying all the church, I'm just saying those that are. There's some people who are very spiritually minded. And there's some people who start out spiritually minded and end up naturally minded in their ministries. There's some people that start out naturally minded in their spirits and just trying to do a good thing. And God comes along and, oh, by the way, I want you to now go here and meet these people and, and you know, like I read a few weeks ago, or your ministry is at an end. <laughs> Get spiritual, in other words. So, my point here in this little bite was summon it. Seek it. Are you summoning? Are you summoning it? Are you calling it in? If it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, then you need to say to him, uh, I need the parts of the kingdom that I need. And I need my friends to have the parts of the kingdom they need. And I'm not satisfied with just continuing to watch the devil win victory after victory after victory after victory in all these lives out here. You know, we're so egocentric. We only care whether or not we win our victories. What about everybody else's victories? Yeah. There are people out there going, God, where are you? And his reply might be, well, I've been trying to get John to pray for you because you don't know what to pray yet, but he does. Because oh. I gave him the knowledge a week ago. <laughs> what if we're co-responsible? What if God has a family attitude of, I told you to take care of your younger brother while I was out today. And you come home and you find out, oh no, what do you mean Junior's over there with a bleeding nose? Well, yeah, I was watching, I, I was, but I, I didn't know he fell. And I just, um, you know, uh, uh. Who do I give the keys of the kingdom to? Here, Peter, you take care of it. And here, apostles, you make sure you tell everybody. And take care of the younger. And watch over the sheep. And feed my sheep. Ah, maybe it's not all about me and my need and my responsibility and my getting the kingdom. <laughs> Next bite. Matthew fourteen thirty one. Matthew 14.31 Matthew 14.31 And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Peter's walking on the water. He's doing it, man. He's doing it. He's in the spirit. He's, he said, bid me come. He came. He's there. Help. Save me. Help. Help. <laughs> okay. Here's my point. Here's what I saw on this this time. Uh, wherefore didst thou doubt? He, o ye of little faith. I got to realizing this week that, do you know nowhere in the entire four Gospels that I know of, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but nowhere does he attribute their failure at things to their sins. He always attributes to their little faith. Why couldn't they cast the demon out? Little faith. Why did he have trouble walking on water? Little faith. Why, when he needed to feed the tens of thousands, did they look at him cross-eyed and say, but we only have these three, and he's going, there's a problem here? Why was it when the storm was so strong 
What do you say? Well, if it wasn't for your sin, we wouldn't have this storm in the first place, but I'll take care of it and hold you over until you get your act together. He never chastised them for their sin. Everywhere I looked, every example I looked at, he never said, it's because of your unholiness. It's because you haven't gone to the priest enough, you haven't bowed enough, prayed enough, worshipped enough. He never said that to his disciples. What he always worked them over on was lack of faith. Fix that, and we'll get a lot of things things done. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees and those who bucked him, what did he do to them? So, have you kept the law? Hey, yes, Master, I've kept the law. Good, come and follow me. Oh, you can't do that. Uh, okay, uh, how about you over there? Well, we don't believe you. Well, then you're dead in your sins. All the corrections on sin went to those who weren't in the camp trying to follow the Savior. But the ones who followed, what did he say to them? Just give me your hands and feet. I, I, all I need to do is wash that. You're already clean. You're clean. I've washed you. You're done. I don't need to keep pointing it out to you. You just need to give it to me when you got it. But meanwhile, in between while, what I need you working on is this. Let me put it to you another way. If we spent as much of our mental energy working our faith and our trust and our love as we do bemoaning and fighting our flesh and our failings and our fears, we might actually be further ahead in the long run. Because Jesus is going, I already took care of all that. You know, it's almost like if he were to return to the church today, he said, he would say, yes, you, you have fought sin and you have done this and you have done this, but these things I have against you, you have not done these. So what we need to focus on is these. Because that's what made us sink halfway in the water. We start out in 1901, 1904, 1947. You know, the spirit-filled movement starts out great. We're walking on water. And then somebody, you know, falls, stumbles, drowns because their faith changed, their concepts changed, their people, they got taught, what are you doing out there? You can't walk on water. Look at the science of that. Huh? Science? Huh? Oh my goodness, you're right. I can't do this. That's mathematically and physically impossible. I'm descended from an ape. I should be falling. Ah! Oh no! God forbid the church would die. Instead of pushing harder to soar higher, we go, oh my God, I should have turned off the engines of this plane. Man wasn't meant to fly. Turn those engines off. But if we do, we'll fall. Better that we fall now than we fall when we get to a higher altitude because that's just going to kill us. At least this way we have a chance of recovering by hitting the runway and ruining the wheels. If we get any higher, we're going to blow up. O oh, ye of little faith. See, we can't afford to look at the water, the waves, the wind. We can only afford to look at the master and keep moving. We can't even look back to the guys in the boat. So your scripture bite on this one is, in contrast to the other ones which convict, this one is to encourage you, turn around and go that way. Nope, nope, I'm certain based on the map of my flesh we're supposed to turn left. No, no, the map doesn't say turn left, it says turn right. Nope, nope, I clearly see it says turn left. Nope, turn right. And this is your church universe right now. Everybody trying to go, which way, which way, which way? I think we'll do it this way. They do it that way for ten years, they die. They turn it this way for ten years, they die. But somewhere in there are these people going that way and they're living. Every generation has those who make it all the way to the end and they go, as it were, I've run the race, I fought a fairly good fight, wasn't a great fight, wasn't a perfect fight, but it was a fight. Because they kept going. You know, people who get caught in POW camps, people who survive them, say one thing. They don't survive it by looking at being in the cage. They go elsewhere. You have to look out to liberty to get out of bondage. 
or your bondage will kill you. That's a fact. That's a fact of the human condition. It doesn't matter whether it's sickness, it doesn't matter whether it's it's oppression of wicked rulers in foreign countries. It really doesn't matter. If our eyes ever get off of him, we start to sink. If our eyes get back on him, we start to rise. It's a spiritual law. Excuse me. I didn't say that it wouldn't require act of will and strength of person. I just said Jesus didn't rebuke them for their sins. He rebuked them for their belief mechanism. I'm not saying he might not have addressed their sins. But he said, you're washed. You're clean. So push. Push forward, O ye of little faith. Next bite. Matthew 26.53. Matthew 26.53. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? All of a sudden, you're going, what's that got to do with me? That's all about Jesus. Know you not that I can ask my Father, and he will send me twelve legions of angels? You know what's funny about this? I never caught the corollary. That's one legion per apostle. I can bring 12 legion here right now. I'm the commander of the host. I can, I can give you each a legion. Need a legion? <laughs> One poor fellow out in the caves, two poor fellows out in the caves, they were full of a legion. You think God can't give a, a legion? I don't know how many angels are out there, but if he can summon 12, 12 legions just for his own personal benefit in his personal trial with his personal friends that he personally handpicked for personal reasons. Get my point here? Personal. What about all the other millions of people that need angels? Well, that's awful selfish. <laughs> but here's my point. He said he could if he wanted to. He didn't because he had to fulfill his destiny to be a lamb led to the slaughter and die. So what are those legions doing now? He died. He rose. He sat on the throne. And now they're all around him. Now what? What are they going to do now? Getting my drift? He's probably sitting here with a clipboard a billion miles long and going, Next! Next! Next, next, he just asked, he just asked, he just asked. We don't even know what we're asking for. Lord, give me wisdom. That's two angels of wisdom, get down there. Lord, give me strength. That's two angels of strength, get down there. Next. That makes an innumerable company of angels something worth hanging on to. But if we don't believe our prayers mean anything and we're just speaking words into outer space and there's nobody listening, then, then to borrow a phrase and rewrite it, there's a whole lot of angels out there doing nothing. There's a whole lot of angels that could have been done and used that aren't being done and used. Meanwhile, a whole bunch of fallen angels are getting to run around the planet scot-free, do what they want, stab, kill, murder... Accuse. And they get free run to the planet. While all the other guys up here who can do anything about it are like, huh. <laughs> There's something wrong with this spiritual picture here. That's what I'm trying to say. There's something wrong with this spiritual picture here. If you believe Jesus has the ability to summon angels before he died, then you should have the belief that he's using them now after he's risen. And if he's using them after he's risen, then you should believe that the moment you pray, your prayers have been heard, Danielle and Daniela, and that legions are on the way. Because if legions are on the way, then we got help. So quickly, so 
help less. Because if we've got help, there's angels all around. And you never know when you're going to entertain one. Are you trying to ask God for these things? Let's do the next bite. Hebrews 11.6 coupled with uh, Revelation 4.11. Hebrews 11.6 Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Here's the question that goes with these two verses. Are you trying to please God or get Him to please you? If we are created for His pleasure, and if it is, and if it is true that um, without faith it's impossible to bring Him pleasure, and if it's true then that our faith brings Him pleasure, are we trying to please Him? Now, when you're at work, you hope that your boss will like you, and be pleased with your performance. <laughs> and some men are very hard to please. But you always try. Because somewhere in the back of your mind, no matter how you believe that you are doing your job because you've got integrity, character, and doing it the right way because you know what's right, there's this little thing in the back of your head that says, I have to make sure that I'm also pleasing to my boss and my boss's boss's boss and boss's boss's boss and but the problem is when it comes to God we don't think that way we think of God as the eternal slot machine to give us a lottery number that's a mixed metaphor <laughs> we look at God as a source a resource a substance to acquire a thing to receive and we measure him based on his response to us. That would mean we're looking at him for our pleasure. You're not pleasing me today, God. I asked for this last week, God. Where are you, God? We become the boss. And he becomes the employee. If our attitude shifts too dramatically away from we're the servants and he's the master. And you know, sometimes that's because of our sonship, our kidness. When you're a kid, you're a son, you're a daughter, after a while you start looking at your parents like, but you owe me this because I'm your kid. I, do you know that all my friends have iPods and I don't have one? And now they got iPhones and I don't have one. You're still making me use one of those old black phones with a handle on it. What kind of parent are you anyway? that the kid is measuring the parent based on their pleasure. Mm -hmm. And whether we know it or not, we were those kids once, and we started measuring our parents based on, did you give me that truck? Did you give me that, give me that, give me that? And then we come into the gospel, and the gospel preachers say, and God desires to give you. And we're like, okay, give it. Come on. Up, hand it over. I've been waiting. We forget that we are, well, to borrow a song line, we are family. We're all working together. We're all putting our neck in the yoke. We're lifting the beam together. We're going to help build one another's houses by pulling them up by rope as we all pull at one time. Think some of those pictures, right, were those in the old days when they did a barn raising or a house raising and everybody comes and cuts the wood and nobody's expected to pull the whole wall up by themselves. That's absurd. But, every man according to his gifts and talents and abilities. But when we look at God, we tend to look at him as, well, he's the source, the all-powerful, the almighty, and how comes he's not responding to my pleasure? All I want to say in this is, yes, he is more than willing to bless. But we must 
come at him realizing uh, we're created for his pleasure. We should be looking at him and going, as it were, you know, he says, can I have five minutes with you? We go, I'm sorry, but we're busy right now. That's, that's, that's going to be unhappy. I have friends that I try to reach who don't call me back. Makes me unhappy. You know what I mean? We all do. We have people that we count on, people we can't count on. Well, what about God counting on us? I can't say that I've been perfect in pleasing God. I am not going to be condemned for the places where I haven't pleased Him because I am washed, I am cleansed, and I just need to step up. But at the same time, I have to say, are my prayers because I want Him to please me? Or are my prayers because He wants to be pleased? When we pray for the salvation of another soul, is that for our benefit? Not really. If we pray for the deliverance of somebody, if we pray for somebody getting rich, we might stay poor and they get rich. That would be a sick thing. <laughs> On one side of the equation, it would be. On the other side of the equation, it wouldn't be. Little old ladies prayed for Moody and he got blessed. Was God pleased? Mm. What pleases God? What makes angels clap their hands and jump up and down and get all giddy? <laughs> they do, you know. They rejoice, you know. They get excitable. I don't know what kind of angels you think we're serving, but they're not a bunch of datas. That is early data, for those of you who don't know data. They're not stoic, I want to be a human robot who wish they could become like man and come out of heaven and learn what the love of a woman is, as some movies try to portray them. They get excited. I think they get jazzed up up there. Did you hear what he prayed just now? Hey, boss, can we go get that one? You bet. Go for it. Boom. Zip, zip. Oh, come on. Look at some worship services sometimes when people finally let loose. They finally go, oh, I'm tired of thinking about my woes and my o's and my ows and my no's. I'm just going to go for it in the spirit. And next thing you know, you're lifted up on angels' wings. Spirit of God. <laughs> Created for his pleasure. It's easy to please him, you know. It's not really that hard. He didn't put more upon you than you're able to bear. <coughs> In fact, he'd even ask you to do all the things that would please him. He only asked you to start doing the first two. Could you please take out the garbage... <laughs> that's get rid of your demons you know could you please do your dishes that's wash your cup inside and outside make sure you're all clean and would you pour me something to drink please cup bearer <laughs> you know what I mean that's not so hard I wonder what our prayers like sound, sound like sometimes up there. I wonder if we think we're negotiating with him. Well, I'm just going to hold back my prayers until he answers the last three. We don't say it that way. No, we don't. Oh, well, some people have. I have heard some people who say, he hasn't answered me in the last month, so I'm not praying for a while. I've heard him say, well, he hasn't done such and such and such and such, so I'm just not going to go to church. I've heard that one. Yeah, we're punishing God. Yeah, I actually heard that, you know. I haven't been to church for the last year because I'm kind of upset at him right now. And this is kind of my way of getting back at him. <clears throat> sure. Deny yourself water, bread, wine, oil. Yeah, that's bright. Really bright. Because you're upset at God today. Well, you know, when you're upset with your neighbor, you don't go visit your neighbor, do you? And if you're having a tip with your best friend, you don't call your best friend, do you? And you don't receive their calls, do you? So if I'm upset at God, I have every right to be this way, don't I? <laughs> oh, dear. What have we done? <laughs> oh, dear. Meanwhile, God's up there weeping, sometimes sighing. Sometimes handing the assignment to somebody who will get the job done. God help us all. Scripture bite. Matthew 6.23. Matthew 
23. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? <coughs> Excuse me. He spoke that to people who weren't following him. He spoke that to people who were fighting that. He spoke that to people who were having a problem with self-righteousness. He spoke that to people who thought they were in the light. We have the light! There's a certain channel on the radio that believes that they're very progressive, forward-thinking. We have the truth. We alone have the light. There are many others out there who say, we have the truth, we have the truth. No, we have the truth. But what if that is dark, <coughs> dark, dark light? Darkness. Do you know I was reading uh, uh, recently, this week, a little clip on science. And uh, did you know that they, they, they've discovered something they call dark matter out in space? There really is such a thing called dark matter. It's a dust. But do you know they can't see it? It's called dark because they can't see it. And it's, uh, the only reason they know it's there is because it exerts gravity, gravitational force. But they can't measure it. They just are aware of it. I don't even know all the depths of how they're aware of it. But I got to thinking about that. I thought, you know, there's so many things in God's universe that we just haven't measured yet. It, I, I've said before that darkness is not just darkness. I, I used to always think of darkness as the absence of light. But, but, but darkness is in itself a light. It, it claims to be a light. It tries to shine itself on things. It comes as an angel of light. It says, hi, I'm the truth. I'm the way. I'm the, I'm the Jesus. I'm the, I'm the Messiah. I'm the anointed one. I'm the, I can show you how to get into the presence of God. Repeat after me. I am. I am. Okay. Somebody else steps up. Repeat after me. Um. And somebody else steps up and says, repeat after me. We. <laughs> We, we propose light, but it's darkness. It, it functions the same. It illuminates. That's light. That's what light does. It illuminates. What's it illuminating? What do these people in the dark think they're illuminating? We're illuminating evil. We're illuminating things. That, that's a principle of light. I've got a flashlight. Click. You know what you can see in dark light? If I can borrow an analogy of, of, uh, of, of, of what do you call them? Uh, black lights? I find black lights interesting. I love black lights. The bulbs, you know. Do you know that if you have glow in the dark stuff, black lights light up glow in the dark stuff, right? But you see what's interesting to me? Is black light makes white documents really white when they're not white. They brighten up whiteness, too. Mm -hmm. Even though it's not white. This odd frequency of light makes things look cheerier and brighter and to those who can handle it, you know. So what happens to those who turn on their dark light, as it were? Does the world look brighter to them somehow? Clearer? Do they feel like they can walk a straight line now? Whereas before they were stumbling? Demons in society as light have pawned themselves off. That's why they say there are no demons. Get it? There's no demons! Look at us. We're all angels. Oh, that's an interesting trick of a phrase. Behold, we are angels. Really? Yeah. Really. No demons here. Just truth. It's a new age. <laughs> we just got to go back to what the Greeks had. We just got off course a couple thousand years. That's all. You just need to bring in the old ways that have been forgotten by the Druids. You know the, those Druids back there. They had some real wisdom back there. They are real smart. They understood things. Mother Nature with those days was worshipped and correctly understood to be paid attention to. She's got to watch over her. She'll take good care of you. We'll take good care of you. <laughs> oh, stupid humans. Dark light killed the light. The people he's talking to crucified him. They crucified him. Dark light crucified the light. 
we are here to shine brightly and let God expose the darkness. We're not trying to find out everybody's sins. That's, that's another issue. We are here to expose <coughs> the infiltration of evil. We are here to find the little spiritual bacteria that are destroying us. We are here to find the little, you know, stuff I don't like thinking about that's smaller than I can see. <laughs> Guess it's too freaky. <laughs> and that's what it is for spiritual people, too. It's too freaky, man. Demons everywhere, man. You've got to be kidding, you weirdo. Yeah, well, I feel the same way about you and your science and some of the things you found at the bottom of a microscope, but okay. Don't tell me I'm eating four million whatever they are. <laughs> I don't care. I'm kidding. <laughs> the truth of the matter is we need to rise up and expose the darkness. And if we expose the darkness, then God can deal with the souls that are under attack. I don't know how many times in my conversations with people I say, yep, they're under an influence of a demon. And the person replies, well, it doesn't have to be a demon. It doesn't have to be a demon. It could just be them, you know. As if that changes anything. <laughs> Fine. If it's not a demon, I shot at air. But if it was a demon, maybe I got it out of there. Maybe they'll find out what's chasing them. Scripture by Psalm 24.10 Psalm 24.10 Who is the King of Glory? The Lord of Hosts. He is the King of Glory. Selah. The Lord of Hosts. The Lord of Armies. Armies. The word armies hit me today. A little bit last night, early this morning. Armies. Lord of armies. Now here's the question I have for you. Since we are obviously part of the army, the host, what part of the army do you want to be a part of? In every army, there are layers or levels of rank and function. Do you want to just be a foot soldier? Is the question. Or do you want to be a general? Or do you want to be a captain? What do you aspire to? There are some people who are content, and understand I'm not making this a derogatory statement, but there are some people content um, to hand out soup. And they never think a, think a thing about the spiritual soul they're handing the soup to. There are some who hand out gospel tracts. And they never think for a minute about the soup the person might need. But the generals and the captains and the majors have to consider how everybody has to be supplied everything. They also have to be aware of the war. They have to be aware of what's happening on that other level. They have to have the spy division giving them reports back. They have to have people who can get into the enemy's camp and look around and go, this is what's going on. Report back to head command. Here's what we need. There have to be people in the army who um, have the responsibility for mobilizing forces. I wonder if we don't miss it sometimes in our promotions because we're too narrow in our beliefs. God says, here, I want you to command this. And we're going, but it's just me. <laughs> it's just me. Well, let me put it to you in perspective. The commander in the middle of the field goes, charge! Is it just me? <laughs> All of a sudden... 10,000 men go running down the hill because one person said charge. So when you're standing in your prayer room, in your prayer closet, going for your prayer walk, and God says, command this, or speak that, or pray this, and you're going, 
Well, I don't know if that makes any difference. It's just me. You don't realize he is using you in a officer, officer's capacity. You're in a particular s chair, slot, place, position. Maybe you're a messenger. Go talk to so-and-so. Say the following things to them. Is it your whole responsibility to tend to and care for their entire spiritual well-being? Not necessarily. You might just be messenger boy today. You might just be deliver the message and go home. Today in the news, another soul found God. How oh, cool. <laughs> Fifty-two messengers were delivered to that house before that person read all the mail. Fifty-two messengers did what they were told, and that mail was stacking up on the doorstep. And one day that soul collapses in a heap, or whatever, and goes, I don't know what to do. And God goes, read the mail. <laughs> I said it to you in advance, and I only know this is true because he's done it to me. How do you know that this uh, collection of scripture bites isn't your mail call and you're going to be needing this in about three weeks? Am I just telling you something that's nice to listen to? Good sermon, Pastor. Thanks, really appreciate it. Glad you uh, spent the time praying what message to give us. That was good. Oh, I'm happy. <laughs> I want you to report for duty. <laughs> this is my command to you. If I be your pastor, report for duty. Not necessarily my duty. Just report for duty. Let's see what the duty officer assigns you this week. <laughs> Maybe I'll come and do duty roll call next week when we come together. Maybe I'll just come up to you and say, so, what was your assignment this week? I'm sharing my live calls. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I'm giving you little scripture bites of right off my plate stuff. And a couple that weren't on my plate. They're strictly for your plate. <laughs> I don't do spinach, sorry. <laughs> but some of you like it. Foot soldier or general? What is God calling you to do? What are you? And if you know what you are, shouldn't you be preparing for your profession in a professional manner? Scripture by 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Scripture by 1 Thessalonians, not Timotheans, Thessalonians, Thessalonians. <laughs> Five. 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are body, soul, and spirit. They must be preserved blameless, ready to get there. Body, soul, and spirit. We spend time on our bodies. We spend a lot of time on our souls. But are you making sure your spirit's healthy? Or you just don't have time to feed yourself? You just don't have time to go to the spirit fountain and get yourself a drink? Do you ever say to the Lord, fill me more? Fill me more. Do you ever say to the Lord, I need more visions, more dreams, do you ever say, Lord, I need more prophecies? I'm starting to run dry on prophecies. I realized this week a very sad thing because of whatever reasons, age, tiredness, brain, sleep, who knows, I started getting fuzzy on some of my visions that I'm supposed to be living off of. I'm supposed to go back and revisit them. Oh, yeah, that's why this is happening to me, he says to himself. 30 years after the vision. Oh, that's right. That was a perpetual vision. I was supposed to watch out that for my entire life. And the vision even showed I did really good at first. And then I started having more trouble with it later on. And, and oops, it's about the time of life I'm having trouble with it. So that vision is now coming to pass in phase three, which means I better do the rest of what I was supposed to do in phase three. And 
You have to keep your spirit fed. You have to make sure it stays informed. You have to make sure that you're, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, not anorexic. You have to make sure that you go out to dinner with the right folks sometimes. Because you can be really spiritually, spiritually hungry and end up hanging out with a bunch of solical, solical people and you come home very, 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 very sick. And you don't know why you're sick because you had good fellowship, you had good time. But your spirit withereth. Scripture by 2 Corinthians 10.4 2 Corinthians 10.4 <coughs> oh, second question. Second question is ten four. That didn't look right. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The weapons of our warfare. It is a war. Never forget why we are at war. I listen to different broadcasts. I listen to people argue and, and talk in stores. And, and we're in a time right now where people keep going there. I don't know why we're at war. And I come to realize that the church has the same cry. That we church members have ended up in the same trap. You see, once upon a time the devil attacked us. But that was a long time ago, man. Why are we being so mean and vicious to these poor heathen out here? Why are we trying so hard? I mean, they're nice people, aren't they? Aren't they? Do we really need to go to war? Isn't this just personal? Isn't this just you wanting to grow your church and you wanting to have more money in your coffers so that you can fly your Learjet and go around the world being important? We don't really need all those resources in the church. The church does just fine poor. I mean, it's really not about this life anyway, right? We don't need resources. And you know, it doesn't do any good to pray these prayers anyway. Because you really shouldn't be praying against anything. You should only be praying for things. Love would pray for things. You don't want to be praying against things. I mean, that, you focus on demons, you get all dark and twisted and messed up. You know, all these people that focus on demons all the time, you know, they're just really negative people. The people are always looking at the end times, walking around with these billboards on their back going, Jesus is returning soon, the end is near. They've been doing that for thousands of years. I mean, has that, has that ever produced anything? Love your neighbor. Bring the soup. Have a kitchen. You know, these are the things that we need. War, who needs war? That's a bunch of stress. I mean, just go get your own. I heard a statement yesterday that was shocking. I heard a person attribute to the President of the United States the following statement. Do you know that we've had seven natural catastrophes in the South during the reign of this presidency? Perhaps these will go away when we get rid of this kind of a president. Huh. So God's punishing America because of the president. No, they didn't even say that because they don't believe in God. They weren't the God channel. They were just drawing an association, a logical association. We've had more natural catastrophes during this presidency on United States soil you know what I mean? But this is the, the, these guys talking about these guys, you know, and these guys talking about those guys. And the point here is, if we just stop all this war stuff, life will go back to good. You know, that, that dog that's out there in the junkyard, he won't bite you if you don't go in the junkyard. What about the ones running loose on the street? Well, if you don't come out of your house, they can't bite you either. Doesn't that sound reasonable? Just don't go where there's any trouble. Stay at home. Watch TV or read a good book or talk about politics, but make sure you don't argue about it. Be calm. 
but let's not get fired up about it. Peace. All this turmoil is messing us up, man. We want harmony. And people who preach war produce disharmony. Meanwhile, you hear the sound of invisible Gestapo boots coming across the spirit. Chunk, 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 chunk. Church falls, church falls, church falls. Government falls, government falls, government falls. Bank falls, bank falls, bank falls. Wall Street up and down and up and down and up and down. But there's no war going on here. And it's just Mother Earth letting us know that we're not taking very good care of her, and that's why she's punished the South. Because all of us have a responsibility to Mother Earth, you know. <laughs> Something inside of me went, snap! The weapons of my warfare, they're weapons. I can do something with them. Because the war did not stop, cease, go away, and we're not just fighting an aggression because... But you hate to say this, the natural world is reflecting what the church world has said for a long time. It's now bleeding into the natural, it's so bad. <coughs> but those who believe in peace know that sometimes you have to take the battle to your enemy's soil. So the, half of the second half of that verse, which is your next fight, is pulling down strongholds. That means we went to their stronghold. They didn't come to ours. The stronghold is where they're holed up. The city that they built in the side of a hill. We went to their city and tore down their stronghold. But the liberal press or the, 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 the doves, if you want to use an old term, or the people who are PC mongers would say, to go against somebody else's gate is very, very wrong at all times. We are all supposed to only fight defensive wars. When your brother comes to you and says, I've lost my foot, I lost my arm, now you can comfort your brother and slap the bully. But we should never go make sure the bully never bites another one. I don't know. That's, that's against the American model of victory. You watch the movies. You get an hour of the bad guy beating the tar out of you and five minutes of the good guy overcoming but the movies we actually do kind of like are ones where the good guy takes the fight, says, that's it, I've had enough. And we get like 30 minutes of the good guys coming after you. Then you hear cheers in the audience, you know. The war is on, still on, will stay on for quite a while yet. And spiritually, we have weapons, and those weapons can go boom, and the boom makes that come down. Please don't try to tear down strongholds with your bare fingers makes for a bloody spiritual mess. Two more and we're done. Ephesians 2.6 says that we are seated in heavenly places. That's the NAS version. He has caused us to sit in heavenly places. That's the King James Version. The question I have for you is this. If we're seated in heavenly places, are you executing your throne rights? It dawned on me that I don't know why, but we get this picture sometimes of, yes, I get to sit in the Spirit. And we don't realize that from that spot, that seat, that place with Christ, that gives us the right to do things. Flip back old world again. Go back and get out of the American mind. But if somebody turns around and hands you the keys to the kingdom... <clears throat> That means you've got control of the gates, the water gates, the, the garbage gates, the, the keys. And then he says, oh, here's the keys, and there's the chair. What do you got? 100% control of the kingdom. And then he says, I'll be back in a little while. Take good care of the kingdom. And he left. That's what the, that's what the parable says. He handed it over. Here's the keys. I demonstrated to you how to run the kingdom. Here's the doors. I showed you where the doors are. Now I'm going to put you in seat you in heavenly places. I'm going to go up, and from here, I'm counting you guys on my committee up here. I'm still the head of the committee. I'm still the head of the house. 
I'm still the head of the family, and you're down there and I'm up here. This is a really important concept. For some reason, we take seated in heavenly places as more like a make you feel better statement. Oh, I'm seated in heavenly places. I'm going to get to go to heaven one day. Or even I'm seated in heavenly places, uh, that means God's presence can come to me on occasion. But we don't see it as I get to allocate. I get to make decisions. I get to, I just have to make sure I'm in line with the, the, the guy who owns the kingdom is all. I'm a joint heir. Yeah, that means I'm an heir. But it also means I have the responsibilities of an heir. Those responsibilities are real. If you believe you're seated in heavenly places. But if you don't believe you're seated in heavenly places, then you're walking on earth, and all you've got is earth. Jesus said. This is what we're struggling with. This is that whole faith battle that we're in, and why we have to keep fighting. I need your help to remind me I have a chair to sit in. And I kind of like, pardon me, Stargate, where the guy who sits in the chair, his DNA is coded to the chair, and then everything responds to him. Concept. And only the guy who has the right DNA gets to sit in that chair and have the chair and the, all the resources of the city, the ship or whatever, respond to him. You put the flesh man in that chair, that chair don't work. You put the spirit man in that chair, and DNA, spiritually speaking, goes into action, and <laughs> chair's live. So you decide. Do you want to be spiritually minded or do you want to be naturally minded? And then decide if you want to sit in the chair. But realize what I didn't quite catch was once you're in the chair, that means you can do some things that you couldn't do before. It's not just a nice place to sit and look across the horizon and I can judge that church for I can see what they're doing. I can see what they're doing. Because, you know, when you're in that chair, it's really high up there. You can see a lot of things people on the ground can't see. Yep, I know why that church is failing. Yep, I know why that brother fell. I know why that sister's messed up. I know why that one. Yep, God needs to do something about that one. Oh my God, look at that over there. <laughs> and all the while, your Heinekiss is sitting in your Cherokis. <laughs> and all the while, you've got an entire court of angels over here. And all the while, you've got a bunch of saints on assignment. And, and uh, last scripture bite. Luke 2 4. Luke 2 4. Excuse me. Hmm. We've done the wrong verse. Did I? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It might be 2 14. No. Two, three, four, maybe? No. Anyway, the verse that I'm looking for is somewhere close to here. There it is. No, no that's not it either. But it's close. It's just not the correct one. It's the verse that says that Jesus grew strong in spirit and wisdom, and the grace of the Lord was upon him. He grew strong in spirit, and wisdom and grace. Spirit, of course, is Penuma. We already know that one. Wisdom is Sophia. He grew in Sophia. It means he could reason really well. It means he knew how to work out that truth. Philosophy is the study of wisdom. And wisdom is the ability to put things together and see the answers. And he grew in that. You have to grow in wisdom. You have to grow in spiritual matters. You have to compare spiritual things with spiritual, and as you compare them, you see things other people don't see. As you weigh them and test them, you have theorems. You know, math is a really good uh, uh, natural teacher to point to a spiritual fact. We create theorems so that we don't have to keep rewriting the same equation. And Paul said, you know, you need to get out of the baby stuff and head up to the mature stuff here. There are certain parts of the Christian life that are just the simple equations. But once you got that theorem all done, you're done. You know that you're supposed to add faith, patience to your faith and, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know these things. Now, take that, do that, and let's add these other pieces to it so that we can see the full effect of our faith, the results. And lastly, we have to realize it's not all about us. There is the grace aspect to the equation. We grow in spirit. We grow 
in faith. We grow in the things that we do, wisdom, knowledge, understanding. And in the end, we're still going to be a little bit short of the glory of God. Because we're finite beings moving towards an infinite goal that leaves us always with a gap. So the grace of God has to come along to carry us and to lift us up and to bring us across so that we can have full functionality. So it will never be all you and it will never be all him. But it is a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step growth. So just be at peace a little bit with your growth. And just keep feeding yourself. Just keep adding every day a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And just don't stop. And I guarantee you, in yet another five years, we're going to look back and go, my goodness, we've come this much further. <coughs> and the other thing is, realize you don't even see all the ways you've changed or are growing. God does. Mm -hmm. He's watching at a far better level than we're able to watch. Mm -hmm. But, hey, if you've got garbage, take it out. If you need to wash the dishes, as it were, wash your dishes. And if he asks you to bring him some wine, bring him some wine. And if you need something back, every now and then the cupbearer does get to walk up to the king, and the king's going to go, why so sad? And you're going to go, well, you see, well, I'm sorry, I hate to disturb you. I'm not trying to disturb your peace, okay? But my brethren down here in Israel are having a real hard time, and they need to go build this temple. And next thing you know, you're the guy running the show because <laughs> volunteers... <laughs> People who care often can end up volunteers, but <laughs> the truth of the matter is we need to be that way. So just let God grow you and realize the speed of that growth is directly proportional to his ability, not yours. Those are your scripture bites for today, and you got off cheap. Lord, we thank you for the meal. We ask, Lord, that you would use these concepts and these scriptures and that you would help us, Lord, in, in both digesting them, ruminating on them, and that they would be strength to our spiritual man. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.